Praise the Lord, Christian Life Center. Let's all stand this morning across the building. Amen. Praise God. It feels good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Before we get into this service, yesterday was our new membership orientation, and it was a wonderful time with newcomers, in it, and we were going through the Word of God, and in the last phase of that new membership orientation, we talk about the responsibility of the church, the responsibility of the individual in the church. And, and as we were talking and reading and studying the Word of God, I just, you know, there was a reminder of each and every one of us has a responsibility. We're all ministers. We're all able to serve, to give to the service in some capacity. And I was just thinking there's no more evident time than right now when we come into this service and we begin to lift up our voices and we begin to, to shift the atmosphere with praise. We shift the atmosphere with worship and, and we begin to invite the presence of the Lord in this place. It's, it's not just the responsibility of the praise team or whoever it is opening prayer, but each and every one of us, literally when we release praise, when we release our voice, it shifts the atmosphere. Something happens when we call on the name of Jesus. Something happens when we say hallelujah. Something happens when we set our mind on Christ and, and we begin to lift up the name of the Lord. So right now, let's bind together in unity, church, in one mind, in one accord with the sole purpose of, of creating, of, of shifting the atmosphere to a place where the Lord can come and inhabit the praises of his people, where the angelic host, the, the ministering spirits can come and minister to the people of God. Right now, church, in one mind, one accord, Let's lift up our voices in the name of Jesus. God, we are here for you this morning. And we want, we want to create an atmosphere where you're welcome, Lord, to do what you please in this place, God. We are hungry for you. We are thirsty for you, God. We desire a divine encounter with the Almighty God this morning. And Jesus, whatever it takes, God, I'm going to lift up my voice. Um, God, I'm going to lift up my hands. Um, I'm going to step out of my comfort zone this morning, Lord, because I want to get a hold of you. I feel like we got about a quarter of the congregation that's involved in this right now. Church, I mean it. When we all bind together, when we all lift up our voices, when we all come into this place, we cultivate an atmosphere where miracles, signs, and wonders take place, where deliverance takes place, where healing takes place, where liberty becomes available to us because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is is liberty I just feel it something this morning someone's got to get out of their comfort zone somebody's got to get out of their comfort zone it's been a while since you felt the presence of the Lord in the divine way it's been a while since you jumped around a little. It's been a while since you really lifted up your voice. But this morning is that morning. In the name of Jesus. One more time, church. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voices. In the name of Jesus. Let's continue in that same vein of, of worship and praise as the praise team comes this morning. You may be seated. Praise the Lord, church. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord this Sunday morning, I invite you right now to put a smile on your face and clap your hands. Sing us together, sing line of Judah. Line of Judah. Line of Judah. You are my Lord and King. You are my Lord and King. Lion of Judah. Line of Judah. Reign over everything. Reign over everything. Lion of Judah. Line of Judah. You are the great I am. You are the great I am. Lion of Judah. Line of Judah. Rule over all the land. Rule over all the land. You are holy.
shout a praise. We come to declare today that there is only one God, and His name is Jesus. If you believe it from the front to the back, why don't you lift up your voice and sing this together with us? See, here are people.
One more time from the front to the back, from the left to the right. Can you lift up your voice? I just began to call upon the name that is above every single name, the name of Jesus. In your own way, whatever it is your thing to do, right now, right where you're at, just continue to exalt that name, that mighty name, that powerful name. Power. 
the name that is above every single name, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Speak that name right now. Yarabo Jesus. Yarabo Riasata. Jesus, we speak that name right now upon this city. Let your will be done in Stockton as it is in heaven. Jesus, pour out your spirit right now upon all flesh in these last days. Jesus, touch this city. Jesus, touch this state and touch this country. May your will be done in it. And we speak your name upon our elected officials. Lord, we ask that you'll continue to strengthen our mayor, that you'll touch our governor and fill him with your spirit, that you'll touch our president, that you'll touch our law enforcement, Jesus, that you'll touch those that are doing your will in this community. In Jesus' name we pray that your spirit reign. And Lord, we ask right now that you'll continue to have the Holy Ghost that is within inside of us, to be bold witnesses for you, that we may be the salt and the light. And right now we speak to the north, we speak to the south, we speak to the east, we speak to the west. In Jesus' name, that it must give up the souls that belong to you and that belong into your kingdom. Lord Jesus, we bring this city, this community, our neighbors, our family, our friends into your name right now. All together, one more time, let's clap our hands and thank the Lord for hearing our prayers. Thank you, Jesus, for doing it. Thank you, Lord, for hearing it and acting upon it. And you may have come into this place saying, that's exactly what I need. I need more of Jesus. I think we all need that. That's why we're in this place right now. And there might be a situation, and we're going to, uh, one specific need we're going to pray for, Sister Barron, Kathy Barron, her brother passed away just uh, this morning, and we want to ask the Lord to comfort and strengthen Sister Barron. And there have been many people who have lost loved ones in the recent months, and so as we talk and pray for Sister Barron, pray, and maybe the Lord will bring somebody into your heart that you're close to. Speak that person's name out. Comfort and strengthen them, and the peace of the Lord will be upon them. And you may have come into this place with a situation in your own life. It might be financial need. It might be a spiritual need. It could be a family situation that you want the Lord to intervene in. Simply raise your hand right now across the sanctuary saying, Jesus, I'm going to give this to you right now. I believe in faith in this service that you're going to intervene, that you're going to touch it all. I see faith in this sanctuary right now rising up. Jesus, we go before you right now for every need in this sanctuary. Lord, we ask that you'll touch Sister Barron right now. Let your strength and your comfort and your peace be upon her and her family. Lord, as many decisions and many things have to be decided, we ask right now that you'll give her, give her your wisdom, Lord, that she may be a witness for you and those in her family. Lord, that your spirit be upon her today. And all those that have lost loved ones recently, we ask that your comfort and your strength continue to be upon the body of Christ. And Jesus, for every need in this sanctuary, your word says that by your stripes we are healed. And we bring these needs to you right now in Jesus' name. Allow the Holy Ghost to speak to you right now. The Lord is doing a great work in our midst. The Lord is intervening in our situations. The Lord is touching our family. The Lord's touching our bodies. Thank you, Jesus. All together, let's thank the Lord for intervening in these situations. We thank you, Jesus. The Lord is good. You may begin to make your way back to your places. Just a couple of announcements to bring to your attention. The Home Builders will be having a, a special uh, event that's coming up on where it is. June the 18th. June the 18th, Home Builders is going to have a special fellowship event. 
talk to Brother and Sister Wiley after service, more information about that. Also, Lifeline is coming up next week. They're going to be have a deeper prayer conference. It's going to be a great time in the Holy Ghost. We'll make plans to be there again next week. You can register on the website, coministry.com slash lifeline, coministry.com slash lifeline. And then there's, I feel like there's something going on this week. I don't know what's, what's happening. Oh, well, that's what it is. A little event called Acts 29 Summer Camp. Subdue Kingdoms. Can you tell they're just a smidgen excited? And I hope the, the parents are excited as well because not only will you have your kid not home for a few days, but more importantly than anything else, they're going to get a hold of Jesus. They're going to get a hold of God. And so that starts tomorrow. Tomorrow is camp. And so after service, there's a meeting in the back choir room. So all the parents that have young people that are going to be attending there, make sure you go to the back choir room. If you have not yet signed up, and I don't know why you wouldn't have, but if you didn't yet, then go to the lobby and make sure you sign up your young person to go to camp this week. There's still some space available. Make sure you do that. And also, youth camp is going to start tomorrow and going to go all the way through Sunday evening. So there's going to be a special Sunday evening service, 6 o'clock West Lane, 6 o'clock West Lane. Everybody say Sunday, 6 o'clock. Now, if you want to be up at 6 a.m. and praying, that's great. But 6 p.m. over at West Lane, we're going to have a great service in the Holy Ghost. It's going to close out our youth camp, but we invite the entire church to come and participate in that event. It's going to be a great time in the Holy Ghost. It's now time for our Sunday morning tithe and offering. If we could stand this morning as we go before the Lord. And as we present the tithe that belongs to the Lord and above and beyond, the offerings that we give out of love and mercy and grace that the Lord has given to us. Jesus, we love you and thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, your provision upon this church, upon us as individuals. Lord, we give back unto you what you've given to us. We know the tithe belongs to you in obedience to your word, and we give that to you back. And Lord, we give offerings above and beyond. And Jesus, we ask that your will be done and provide for every need in this sanctuary and all those in this church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you as you march or as you give online this morning.
Hallelujah. 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 Anybody glad to be in the house of God today? Amen. Feels so good in the house of God. Can we stand to our feet? You know, one thing that I was thinking about, I'm so grateful that we are having this time of meet and greet. I still hear some of it going on. Amen. Praise God. And that's all right. There is a blessing that comes over the people of God when we gather together as one people to praise the name of Jesus. Something beautiful happens. And you know, during these past few years, these past couple years, one of the biggest strategies of the enemy is to try to divide the people of God, try to distance each other, us from each other, because he knows that when we are distant, then we feel like objects, then we feel like ghosts. And nobody likes feeling like a ghost, like they're not recognized, like they don't exist. The enemy has been trying to prey on people's minds and hearts to tell you that you are alone. But I'm here to tell you today that you are not alone. God is with you. And there's a people of God in this place that we love you. Amen. Why don't you point to somebody today, tell them, I am glad you are here. Amen. I'm so glad you're here. Wave to somebody else and say, I'm glad you're here. Make eye contact with somebody. Say, I recognize you. I see you here. And I'm so glad you made it to the house of God. Amen. Now, can we tell that to Jesus? Lord, I'm glad you're here tonight, this morning. God, I'm glad you're here to fellowship with your people. I feel the Holy Ghost. Is anybody glad that God is in the building this morning? Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Woo. Amen. God has come to fellowship with his people today. Why don't you open up your Bibles? We're going to start off here in the book of Mark, chapter 4. And we're going to have a Bible study this morning. Amen. Amen. And the Lord is going to meet us today. Mark, chapter 4, verse 10. Hallelujah. Through 12. Mark chapter 4, verse 10 through 12. The word of God says, But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parable, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven. Wow. I'm going to do my best today to talk about this passage of Scripture. We hear a lot, many times, uh, in service about the power of the Word of God. But today, I want to talk about our role and our position in receiving the Word of God. It's very important to have both of those. Not just the God that dictates Word, but He also teaches us how to receive the Word, how to make our hearts good ground. Does anybody want to be good ground for the Word of God today? Hallelujah. Can we just pray right now that God would have His way? Lord, Father, we come before you today, Jesus. We love you, God, this morning. We worship you this morning, God. We thank you, God, for making yourself known to us today. You're already talking, God. You're already speaking to us today, God. I pray, God, that you would just move in our midst today. Enable us, God. Enable our ears to hear, our spirits to receive your word today, God. We love your word, God, and we embrace it, Father, this morning. As your people, God, we love your word, God, and we receive it today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Can someone just give a hand praise to the Lord? And just praise him today. Come on, just praise him. Just praise Him because He's in this place. Come on. Just give Him glory because He's a living and a true God today. Thank you, Jesus. 
You may take your seats this morning. Amen. And keep your Bibles by you because we're going to go to, through quite a bit of Scripture. Amen. I'm so grateful to be here with you all. And one thing that I need to mention today is, first of all, I have my mother here all the way from Mississippi visiting me. Amen. <laughs> Sister Liz. Amen. And it's so gr I'm so grateful to have her here with, with me. And it's the first time she's been in service with me. And also my wife who's preaching alongside of me here, amen, interpreting the word of God. Hallelujah. With the help of God, we'll do it together, amen, and preach the word today. Amen. Well, we've read today the book of Mark, uh, chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. And many times this portion of scripture can be a little bit confusing, but we're going to learn the word of God today. Amen. Praise God. And what we're here to learn today is our position in receiving the Word of God. There is no doubt that the Word of God is powerful. There is no doubt that the Word of God is mighty. It has creative power. And I've talked about that a few times here, amen, and I've talked about the power of the Word of God, even from the beginning, from the beginning of creation. We know that God spoke His Word, and through the might of His Word, He created something out of nothing. That is the God that we serve, and even the reason why He is described as the Eternal Father, not because he gives birth like human beings, but because he can create something out of nothing. He is a God that speaks a simple word and produces a very complicated result. You've heard me say it before, but I'm going to say it one more not in time because we have to remember the power of the word of God. Hallelujah. One thing that we learn in high school, we learn throughout our classes, we learn that light is not a simple thing, but many times there are, there are complicated aspects, laws that are active within the law of the light. It's a, they don't know what it is. It's waves. It's, it's something. We, they don't quite understand what light is, but it's a very complicated process to produce what we see. And we know that light is even in many different spectrums. There's what we call gamma ray, what we call infrared. If anybody's heard of infrared, it's this specific color inside of light that we cannot see with our naked eye, but we need machinery to be able to see infrared light. Uh, and this is the way that God functions, because in the beginning, he said, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, you see, God did not have to speak a complicated expression. He spoke a simple thing, and the universe itself reacted to God's simple word, and it produced a complicated result. That is the power of the word of God. What that tells us, it doesn't matter how complicated our lives may be. It doesn't matter how complicated your problems may be. All you need is a simple word from God, and he can change everything. Come on, does anybody believe it this morning? Does anyone know what I'm talking about today? That God can speak in a simple way and he changes everything. But now another question comes and it's the question that I want to speak about today is how do we as the people of God, how do we receive the word or how do we put ourselves in the right position to be good ground for the word of God to come and give life? I want to go to the book of Matthew now, chapter 13. The book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 10 through 14 it is a very beneficial thing that when you read a story in the book of a book in the four gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John you go to other places within the gospels that speak about the same story and the same situation many times it gives you a well-rounded view of what Jesus is trying to say in Matthew chapter 13 verse 10 it talks about this same moment in time both of these passages are very important for what I want to communicate today with the Lord has placed in my heart to say. Matthew chapter 13, verse 10, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you 
to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you, sh you will see, and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn, so that I should heal them. Now we have another reference in the Word of God. We see the book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 10. It describes this moment in time. Matthew also describes this. And it attributes this here to a fulfillment of prophecy in the book of Isaiah. So guess what we're going to do now? We're going to go to the book of Isaiah. Hallelujah. Now we can find this prophecy first uttered in Isaiah, chapter 6. And we're going to start in verses 1 through 3. The book of Isaiah, chapter 6. And we're going to read verses 1 through 3, then we're going to jump to verses 8 through 10. The Word of God says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Uh, this is a very important way to start off this chapter here. It's talking about this vision that Isaiah had. He had a glimpse of the throne room of God. And the power of God was so mighty that even the angels themselves, they could not bear to see God in all of his glory. But they recognized the holiness of God and the majesty of God. And they worshiped God crying to one another, he is holy, he is holy, he is holy. And in this moment in time, the word of God says that he sought to find a man that would speak his word. Let's go to verse 8. And it said, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, this is Isaiah speaking here am I, send me. Hallelujah. Verse 9, it says, and he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. Tremendous. Now, in reading this passage of Scripture, perhaps it contradicts a little bit of our expectations of what the role of the prophet Isaiah was. Many times when we look at the prophets, we often assume that they were called to the people of God to set them free and to preach a word that would set them free. It wasn't that simple for Isaiah. The call that God had given Isaiah was actually to speak in such a way that it would blind them from seeing spiritually and it would make them not able to perceive the word of God. Wow. Now we have to ask ourselves why and we can find the reasons why here in the book of Isaiah chapter 44. 
And in Isaiah chapter 44, it begins to describe the reasons why this spiritual blindness and the spiritual deafness was given to the people of Israel. Isaiah chapter 44, we're going to start here in verse 13. It says, the craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks one out with chalk. He fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with a compass and makes it like the figure of man. According to the beauty of man, that it may remain in his house. He cuts down cedars for himself. These are trees. And takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants pine, and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it, some of that wood, and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half he eats meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. And even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god. His carved image, he falls down before it and worships it. Prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my God. They do not know nor understand, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, no is there, nor is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burnt half of it in the fire. Yes, I have also baked bread on its coals. I have roasted meat and eaten of it, and shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? The same principle is expressed in the book of Psalms. I want to take you there before I unpack the people of Israel during the prophet Isaiah's time. I want to take you to Psalm uh, 115. Psalm 115, verses 4 through 8. It says here, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they, they have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Wow. What was God doing to the people of Israel in the time of Isaiah? The people of Israel in the time of Isaiah practiced two things that were against the will of God. First, they were unjust to each other. The people of Israel during the time of the prophet, they would steal from one another. And they would participate in unjust economic transactions. Then they would take the earnings of that unjust transaction. They would go and they would buy a sheep. They would buy a lamb. They would buy an ox. Then they would take the ox that was purchased with unjust money and they would take it to the temple and attempt to sacrifice it to God for forgiveness of their sins. And they attempted to give to God a sacrifice that from its core was tainted with sin. 
with their sin, they purchased an animal to attempt to clear their sin. So in the book of Isaiah, God tells the people of Israel, I am tired of your sacrifices. I am sick of your sacrifices. It doesn't matter how much you sacrifice. It is my will that you be just to the poor, that you do righteously, because obedience is greater than sacrifice. There was no amount of sacrifices that they could give to clear the sin that they used to purchase those things. That was the first thing. And the second, you see, the people of Israel, they did not only attempt to worship Yahweh, But they also added to their religious practice the worship of Baal. They worshiped other gods. They worshiped Yahweh only in the midst of other gods as well. They were doing it just in case. They were doing it just in case those other gods could give them prosperity as well. They were attempting to sacrifice and serve and worship a a, a whole group of gods so that by some way, by some magical incantation, by some supernatural way, they could receive some type of blessing for what they were doing. And so this is what we see in Isaiah chapter 44. It's saying that, you, that these individuals, the people of Israel, they would go and they would cut down a tree. And with half of that tree, they would begin a fire. And in that fire, they would cook for themselves bread and meat. And they would warm themselves in the fire. And with the other half, they would begin to carve it out, a, an idol in image. And take this block of wood and they would set it in their homes. And they would say, you are my my God, this piece of wood that I use to make a food for myself, you are my God. They would bow to them. And what Psalm 115 says, that these gods, though they had an image of God, they had no power because they had eyes, but they could not see. They had ears, but they could not hear. So what God was doing to the people of Israel is he was giving to them the attributes of the gods that they would worship. He gave to the people the eyes of their gods that would not see. He gave to the people the ears of their gods that could not hear. He gave to them the inability to see and to perceive the word of God. Why? Because they already had the word of God. They already had prophets preaching to them. They already had individuals speak and seeing and saying, thus saith the Lord. But they themselves chose to turn away from God and begin to serve these idols. God did nothing more and nothing less than their own will. He gave them over to their own desires. Romans chapter 1, it talks about this. It says that God gave them over to the lusts of their own hearts. He gave them over to the desires of their own hearts and their own minds. He gave them what they wanted. He said, you want a God that's made of wood? You want a God that's made of silver? Then I'm going to give you that God that's made of wood and silver. And because that God has no eyes, it has the form of of eyes but cannot see, then I will curse your eyes to not be able to see the word of God. This is the Israel of the time of Isaiah. But now, if we go back, if we go forward centuries and we go to the time of Jesus, Jesus calls upon the curse and the prophecy of Isaiah and he applies it to the people of Israel of his time. Now let's go back here to the book of Mark, chapter 4. Because now we have the theological context, the theological impulse of what Jesus is actually talking about in the book of Mark. In the book of Mark, we read that he is calling to This prophecy in Isaiah. In verse 12, he says, Seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, 
lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Now, this brings about a few more questions. Because we know that the Jews, he is speaking to Jews, he's speaking to Pharisees. And if you know anything about Pharisees in the New Testament, they did not serve idols. They did not worship idols. They did not create idols. So at first, there may seem a little bit of of, of contradiction here. We're talking about a Jewish people that did not bow down to idols. So how is it that Jesus was calling, he was referencing a prophecy that talked about a people that served idols? We'll see it here. If we go further in the same book of Mark, chapter 7, Verse 6, Mark 7, 6 says, He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. And he said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Wow. So here he begins to highlight the sin of the Pharisees. What was the sin of the Pharisees then? The sin of the Pharisees was that they were not serving the true God of Israel. They were serving a God of their imagination. They were serving a God of their fantasy. They were serving a God that was pleased by their actions. But their actions actually were not pleasing to God. Because in reading the word of God, they would add to the word of God and add to the salvation of the word of God. And they would add rules and all kinds of things that, would, that corrupted the word of God. And they would do things like fasting. And they would fast and they would stand on the street corner corners proclaiming to all the people I am fasting look how holy I am and they wouldn't wash themselves they wouldn't take a shower why so that people could see what they were doing they took things that were in the word of God and they began to corrupt them with human tradition and they began to worship a God that was not the God of the holy book but somehow they justified in their hearts that there was a God that was pleased by their actions and they began to measure each other we see stories in the word of God of the Pharisees how when they would give offerings the Pharisees would come in and they would allow the, their money to sound loud as they were giving in the offering bin and showing off all the things that they were giving and here is this old woman giving just a few pennies just a few cents and Jesus tells his disciples you see this that you're seeing right here who has given more? I tell you, this woman that has given a few cents has given more than all of these Pharisees because these Pharisees are serving a God of their fantasy that is actually pleased. God doesn't care about our money. He doesn't care about how much we give him. What he wants to know is, is your heart in the right place? Is your heart willing? Do you give cheerfully? Do you give without wanting glory for yourself? Do you do the things that you do, right? Because the, all these things, they were good. It was a good thing to give an offering. It was a good thing to give to the Lord. It's a good thing to give for the work of the kingdom of God. But as soon as giving becomes a social status 
in our eyes. As soon as giving becomes the show of how holy I am, because how much I am giving. No, now we are crossing over to a God of our imaginations, a God of our fantasies, a God that is not really pleased by what we're doing. And you know, anything can become that. Can I tell you that even singing on this platform can become a Pharisaical thing? It is a good thing to, pr to praise the Lord, Brother Silliman. It's a great thing to give God glory, even on this platform, to lead the people of God in worship. But as soon as it becomes a social status of how good I am and how holy I am, and you really think that pleases God? It doesn't please God. Now, I'm not saying that we should come up here and not worship the Lord. No, we should worship the Lord, but the Word of God says that He is searching for people that worship Him in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. Uh, God is looking for people who have a pure heart and say, God, I am not here because I'm worthy. I'm here because you're good. I'm here because you're lovely. I'm here because you have loved me. When you begin to worship God in spirit and in truth, then God begins to meet with us and begins to commune with us. There comes a problem, though, when we actually think we're pleasing the Lord. We're building an idol in our minds, even with things that are considered good and honorable and even just, we begin to build a God of our imaginations that says, well, I dress right, and I talk right, and I wear the right things, and I comb my hair the right way, and I dress this way, and I dress that way, and I sing in the choir, and I sing in the praise team, and I preach on this pulpit, and that makes me holy. It doesn't matter what you do for God that may look right. It may look holy. But if in your spirit, in your heart, you have a motive in your heart to exalt yourself, Oh, we're not here to give glory to ourselves. We're not here to give glory to this because we have a big building here in this place and we have beautiful lights and we have wonderful instruments. But I tell you this, God, he loves it when we praise him, but when we praise him in spirit and in truth. So the sin of the Pharisees was a little bit different than the sin found in the people of Israel in the time of Isaiah. But nevertheless, it produced the same thing. It produced that God saw the God that they created in their minds. And he says, that God does not exist. The God that is pleased with your actions doesn't exist in this world. And because that God doesn't exist, I'm giving you eyes that cannot see. And I'm giving you ears that cannot hear. But you know, the word of God never leaves us hopeless. It never leaves us without a light at the end of the tunnel. Because we also see in the Word of God that God gives the keys for our eyes to open and our ears to open. I want to go back here to chapter 4, verse 21. I hope you're learning something from the Word of God. Amen. Chapter 4, verse 21. You know what? Let's read right after verse 12. Right after we see here in verse 12, the invocation of this prophecy in Isaiah that seeing they may see and, and not perceive, then Jesus goes into the parable of the sower, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown, when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. They have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world. 
the, deceitful, the, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Here's the key. Verse 21. And he said unto them, Is a lamp brought to be under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. That is very important. Why? Because God is saying you cannot hide from this principle. The light in the lampstand is meant to shine. You cannot fool God. God is not mocked. You cannot fool Him with your false motives that look good. You cannot fool Him with your actions. Why? Because God is the light and He sees all things. And so He says you cannot hide from the light. Everything is going to be exposed that needs to be exposed. But in verse 23 it says, If anyone has ears to hear... Let him hear. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. This is the principle. Do you want to listen? Do you want to hear? Do you want to understand the Word of God? Are you hungry to understand the Word of God? Do you desire to receive the Word of God and be changed by the Word of God? Then your ears are blessed to hear. Hallelujah. For the Word of God says... If you have ears to hear, if you have given your ears and say, God, whatever you have to say, it's all right. If it corrects me, it's all right. If it changes me, it's all right. If you have ears to hear, then let them hear what the Word of God has to say. But be careful. Be careful the way that you hear because the measure that you give, it's going to be measured back to you. What that talks about is a supernatural participation. As hungry as you are to hear the word of God, God will supernaturally enable your ears to be perceptive to the changing power of the word of God. But if somehow in your heart, you have a stony ground, and you have ground with thorny bushes, and in your heart, you're polluted with other desires, and you tell, tell God, God, I want to hear your word, but I love the world a little bit too much. Uh, God, I love your word, but I, I like doing these other things a little bit too much, and I'm not ready to give that up, and I'm not ready to give that other up. Uh, then your heart has become a ground of thorns, uh, and God is telling you this morning, uh, be careful the way that you hear because the measure that you give it will be measured back to you can I tell you this here this should not be a word that leads us to fear it should this should be a word that brings joy to our hearts because you know what that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that because of your background because of the sin that you've committed in your life. It does that means that it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you started. It doesn't matter where you are even right now. You could have been the worst sinner before walking into these doors of this building. But as soon as you hear the word of God and you say, God, I may not be perfect, but my ears are open to you today. That means that you can receive something from the Lord. That means that the very moment you say, God, I'm tired of myself. I just want you. I'm tired of living for myself. I just want to live for you. Then God blesses you to be transformed. Woo, hallelujah. 
that means it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. It doesn't matter what language you speak or the color of your skin. It doesn't matter what your past has been when you come into the presence of God and you hear the gospel. All you have to do is be willing. All you have to do is be hungry. All you have to be is thirsty. Because blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness, For they shall be what? For they shall be filled. But you got to be hungry for God. You got to want the Lord. You got to want him today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you know. It's easy to accept the word of God when it completely agrees with us, when it completely lines up with our lifestyle. If you have always had a sense of morality that you're never supposed to cuss, and when you come to the house of God and they say, hey, that's not righteous. Oh, that's easy. Let me walk that way. Oh, yeah, I must be righteous. The challenge comes when the word of God begins to challenge who we are. And challenge the way that we live. That's when the rubber meets the road. Not when it's easy, but when it's hard. When the word of God begins to be released to the people of God. And it begins to rub against our habits and the things that we're used to practicing. And oftentimes things that other Christian peoples have said is okay. But it's only because uh, they haven't learned from the word of God. Uh, the problem comes uh, when we begin to compare what the word of God has said about what it means to please the Lord. And it's not matching with our lifestyle. And it means that it's going to uh, interrupt a few things that we used to do. It's going to interrupt a few things that we used to listen to. It's going to interrupt a few things that we used to watch. Uh, and it begins to rub us the wrong way and say, God, uh, it is this an hard thing. Uh, who can bear it? Uh, but we have to get in our spirits uh, what the Apostle Peter had in his spirit. Uh, when Jesus was preaching a hard word that was meant to transform the people of Israel, the Apostle Peter went to Jesus. He said, this is a hard saying. Who can bear it? Uh, and Jesus asked the Apostle, Peter he says will you go as well but Peter says where else can I go only you have words of eternal life only you have the word that can change me hey only you have the word that can transform me only you have the word that can change my life because God knows I can't change myself God knows I can't change I can't change my own mind I can't change I can't heal my own depression. I can't heal my own anxiety. I need a word from God. I need a word from God to change me. Ooh, I need the spirit of the Lord. There's not enough self-help books that can change me. There's not enough psycho psychological books. I need a touch of the Holy Ghost. I need a touch of the Holy Spirit. Ooh. And you see, some of you are getting excited because you know what I'm talking about. As much as you tried to change yourself, as much as you, you couldn't do it. But when you came to the house of God and you had a touch of the Spirit, whoo, ha, ha, ha. Why? Because when God releases his word, things have to change. And things that weren't there in your life, he put them there. Love that you never experienced before. He gave you that love. You never knew what it tasted like. You never knew what it felt like. But God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. Hey, not so that you can be bound in darkness, but so that you can be set free. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Can we just raise our hands for a few moments right now? Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your transforming word. Thank you, God, for your word that changes us. Hey, 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 hey. My God, my God. I feel God today. Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, God. I feel you today. I feel you today. A few more things that I need to say today. Hebrews 4.12, it gives us a direct view of the nature of the Word of God. 
This is why it's so difficult sometimes, uh, especially when the word begins to be launched to us and it demands transformation. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living, it's alive. In the KJV it says it's quick, it's alive, and it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It says it here, it piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and of marrow and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. This is how powerful the Word of God is. It says it's sharper than any sword. You can't get a sword that's this sharp, that it can enter into your mind. It'll enter into your soul. It'll enter into your spirit like it's happening right now. And it begins to search and it begins to look around uh, and the word of God it begins to probe us uh, like an individual that walks into your home uh, and you try to clean up your home uh, but you only threw all the garbage into one room uh, and here's this individual about to walk into that room where you hid all of your garbage uh, he say not that room no no not that room why because I put all my stuff there I put all the stuff that I didn't want to clean up. I put all the stuff that I didn't want to address. I put all the sin that I didn't want to give up. Hey, I'm talking to someone this morning. I put all those subjects that I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to give up. But then the Word of God begins to discern the thoughts of the mind. And it says, I know you're hiding something. I know you haven't been willing. And I know it's in that room back there. And you got to be careful because if if you tell the Lord, God, not that room, then he'll turn back to you and he'll say, I'm going to measure back to you what you give to me. But if you're willing, if you say, God, echo, whatever you want to do is all right with me. I know I got dirt in my back room. I know I got dirt in my back room, but I'm opening the door, God. Whatever you need to do, I feel the spirit on me. Whatever you need to do, open up the windows. It's time to air it out. It's time to air out my soul. It's time to clean something. He who hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church today. In Jeremiah chapter 1, it describes the nature of the Word of God again. And it says very clearly, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Say, See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Wow. God said to Jeremiah, I've put my word in your mouth. And I put my word in your mouth to do this. I need you to tear down some strongholds. I need you to uproot some satanic things that are in the people of God. I need to send you out to tear down and to destroy. But once you've cleared the ground, then I have called you to build. Now I have called you to plant where you uprooted old things. I've come to plant seeds of righteousness and seeds of holiness, seeds of faith, seeds of love, seeds of hope, seeds of power. But until that happens, i got to clear some things out. Uh, until that happens, this building that's here, this building that Satan has constructed in your mind uh, to keep you bound to sin, to keep you bound to your depression, this way of thinking about your life, uh, this way of thinking about your past, uh, this way of thinking that says, I can never change. Yeah, that building, i got to come with the Word of God, and i got to tear it down. Why? Because I'm getting ready to build a new thing. I'm getting ready to do a new thing, and I'm going to build wonderful places of faith. The doctrine of the Word of God. 
I'm coming to teach you new things. Uh, why, this is why the Word of God says in 2 Corinthians uh, that the weapons are of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they're powerful t- through God for the pulling down, the tearing down of strongholds. Hallelujah. It tears down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge uh, of God because Satan has been trying to fortify your mind from the Word of God. He's been trying to fortify your heart with lies about God, uh, trying to convince you that God does not love you, that God does not want you, and it's the enemy trying to fortify walls today. But I'm here to give a word to tear it down in the name of Jesus. Because if you're willing to give it all to God, God's going to tear down that insecurity and he's going to give you faith today. Hey, he's going to set you free. He's going to set you free. Yes, he is. Does anyone believe it this morning? I want to take you to one more verse of scripture today. And it's in Isaiah chapter 55 verses 1 through 3. I'm wrapping up the the word that God has given me this morning. But I want to talk about life today, the power of life. Isaiah chapter 55. This is powerful. You see, it may be very strong, perhaps very, very potent, the kinds of things that we've read from Isaiah. But can I tell you, God, he never leaves people in condemnation. He never leaves individuals without hope. But there's hope for us today. The Word of God says, Isaiah in chapter 55, verse 1, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. It's not like what we're hiding in that back room actually gives us life. It's not like what God is asking for us to give up is the source of our joy. The Word of God says, why are you spending money on what won't make you happy in the first place? Why are you even spending your time there? And guess what? You can come to the house of God without money, without anything to your name. You can be the poorest person in Stockton, California, come to the house of God and still receive a change in your life and still feel the touch of the Holy Ghost. You don't need to do anything. Why? Because God already did it in himself. Jesus did it on the cross, and he paid the price so that you can have access to be transformed. So that you can have a way in. He says, come. If you're thirsty, come. You don't have to prove yourself to anybody. You don't. You see me with a tie, with a suit. Uh, and, and, and this is for reasons because uh, I believe it's a good thing to come and worship God with reverence. Uh, but if you don't have a single tie, if you don't have a single suit, if all you do is come to the house of God in pajamas because you don't know better, I'm telling you right now, you can still receive a touch of God and you can still receive a transformation because God is no respecter of persons he doesn't care how much you have in your bank account he doesn't care what you drive Yeah, you see, the world cares about that kind of stuff. Uh, The world cares what kind of brand you have on. The world cares what kind of shoes you're wearing. Uh, But God doesn't care if you have Jordans or if you have sandals. Uh, Come unto me, you who thirst, uh, and I will give you rest. Uh, I will set you free. Oh, is anyone hearing the word of God today? Come as you are. And God will receive you. You see, this is really powerful right here because it says, if we continue on in this same chapter, and we read in 
verse 3, it says, incline your ear. Incline your ear. Open up your ear. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Wow. Verse 6. Jump into verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. That's important. Forsake. Let the wicked forsake his way. And let the unrighteous man forsake the way that he or she has been thinking. Let him draw near, let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. How many are grateful for the mercy of God? And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Whoo! This is why where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. And it then said something really interesting here. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Hey, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, oftentimes we get used to using this portion of Scripture in a particular way to say that the plans of God are different than our plans, which is true. It is true that the plans of God differ from our plans because God, He is what we call an omniscient God. He is an all-knowing God, and because of that, He has plans that we cannot contemplate. We just simply have to trust in Him and have faith in Him that He's leading us the right way. We usually use this, use this passage like that. And it is valid. It is true. But in its complete context, it says here, the unrighteous forsake your thoughts, the wicked forsake your ways. And then he says, because my thoughts are not your thoughts. In other words, if your thoughts are unrighteous, the thoughts of God are righteous. If your ways are unclean, the ways of God are clean and holy. So when he says, for my thoughts as the heavens are higher than the earth, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. What he's saying is that my way of thinking is so holy. This is why the angels cry, holy, holy, holy. It's not simply saying that my plans aren't your plans. It's saying my way of thinking is sanctified. It is holy. It is good. It is pure. It is lovely. It is good. Why? Because all good things come from the Father of lights above. All things proceed from the Lord who is way above us. When we are caught up in our own vices, in our own lifestyles of sin, God compares that with being lowly, with being earthly. And even in some occasions, it describes it as being instinctual and an animal. We are so low and base. But then God does not leave us there. He says, look, my thoughts may be way higher and way purer than your thoughts, but I am inviting you up to receive my thoughts and it is my desire not to leave you as you are but to cleanse your life verse 10 it says for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. What is this speaking about? Does it apply to prophecy and the promises of God? Yes but it also applies to the sanctifying power of the Word of God. That's what it's talking about. It's saying, you know how my thoughts are higher than your thoughts? They're more holy than your thoughts. They're clean. 
as the rain comes down from heaven, I send forth my word into your heart and your mind. And it doesn't matter how corrupt your mind is. It doesn't matter how corrupt your mind has been and your fantasies have been. It doesn't matter how corrupt your actions and your sin may have made you. If you just keep coming to the house of God and you keep opening up your ears as the rain comes down from heaven and as our pastor and the preachers begin to preach, they're sending out the watering of the word and it's going to fall down on your dry ground and your ground will not remain dry, but the word of God will accomplish uh, what it has sent it to do uh, in your soul. If you remember last week, uh, I felt it in the Holy Ghost. Uh, I saw lots of green throughout the congregation, and I saw patches of dry, and as we were worshiping, and we were worshiping songs uh, that talked about God, and talked about the Word of God, I saw a sprouting, and the dry, gray places, uh, they began to turn green. That's what the Word of God does when you come to the house of God. Can I tell somebody this morning, it doesn't matter. The enemy's been trying to discourage you because you haven't been seeing the changes that you thought that you would see. I've come to tell you this morning if you just keep on coming to the house of God and you keep letting the word of God shower your mind. Let the word of God shower your mind. The promise is that his word will not come back void. It's going to do something in your life. And it's going to do exactly what God had sent it to do. Hey. And in verse 12, it says, For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. And instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Wow. The greatest miracle of all, if the praise team can begin to come up here. The greatest miracle of all that is being talked about here is not the miracle of opening up the Red Sea. It's not the miracle of manna. But it is the miracle of transformed lives. It's the miracle of transformed lives. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Where your family and your friends, they used to know who you were. They used to know the kinds of things that you would do, the kind of evil that you would be involved with, the kind of anger that was in your soul. But when God got a hold of you, the rain of his word, it brought life. And something supernatural happened. The trees, they started clapping their hands, and the hills begin to sing with joy. Kodabo, sadaba. They began to see the change that was in you. They say, how did you get the way that you are? Something's different about you. Something supernatural happened in you. Something changed. You're different. And can I tell you, the greatest miracle is always that God, he knows how to bring life where there is no life. He knows how to transform even the most broken situations and the most broken minds and the most broken hearts. He knows how to mend the hearts. This is why the Word of God says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me, what? To give sight to the blind, to mend the brokenhearted, to set free the captives. To set free the captives. <laughs> That's the greatest miracle that God has come to do. But you know, when the Word of God has come to heal us, when the Word of God has come to give joy and to give peace, many times is the easy part. But as time progresses on and we begin to read the Word of God, many times God... He begins to challenge us to change in certain ways, to change our way of thinking in certain ways. And I'm not here to talk specifically because many times everyone is a different place in life. 
And I can tell you right now, even I myself, in my place where I am today, God is challenging me to change. And it is my choice. It must be my decision to say, either God, have your way, or to close that room up and say, God, I don't know if I'm willing to do that. I don't know if I'm willing to change my mindset in that way. And everybody's at a different place in life. And God is challenging us to become more like him. He's challenging us to think like him. He's challenging us to feel like him, to be transformed, to be like him. And even now, the word of God is searching your heart and your mind. And he's telling you, look, you've been resisting me for way too long. And I've come here to change you and transform you. But you've got to be willing. For the gospel is for whosoever will. And it will always be for whosoever will. Whoever wants it is going to get it. See, the the Word of God says that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let's stand to our feet today. You know what hunger and thirst means? Hunger and thirst has less to do with craving and more to do with need. You see, the way that we come to the Word of God we have to come more. We have to come to God with Him being more than our favorite flavor. We have to be coming to God with more than this just being the favorite thing that I like to do. And you know what? Coming to the house of God is my favorite thing to do. I love to come to the house of God. Amen. Yeah. And you know what? The Spirit of God, it is my favorite flavor. It's the favorite flavor of my soul. But can I tell you, I crave God not because He's a good flavor like in Baskin Robbins, but it's because I need God. Come on. I crave God. I have hunger for God, not just because He's my hobby, because but because without him, I'm going to die. Hey, without him, I can't live. Without him, I move and I breathe and I have my being. I can't live without God. I can't survive without God. Without God, my soul will be destroyed because I know when God releases his word, he releases life. Some, somebody's got to get hungry for the things of God today. Can I tell you? Many times, we become a little deaf. We become a little less perceptive of the voice of God in our lives. And we feel less love than what we used to. And less of His presence than what we used to. And many times, we get used to praying, Lord, make me more sensitive to Your Spirit. Okay? Make me more perceptive of Your Spirit. When all along, the most appropriate prayer is to ask God to make you more hungry. Be more hungry. Because when you're hungry for the things of God, God won't resist himself. He pour, he'll pour out his spirit on you. He'll let you feel his presence. Like we read about the, the parable of the sower and the seeds, many times the reason why we feel distant from God is because we've concerned ourselves with the things of this world a little too much. We've concerned ourselves with the advancing of our careers, the advancing of our jobs, for good reason. I need to provide for my family, so i got to work harder. Holy, righteous reason. It's a good thing for us to work for those whom God has play, placed in our charge. I need to work. I need to spend my time providing for my home, for my household, for my family. But when work becomes greater than coming to the house of God, I'm talking to someone here, when all the, the cares of this world takes the priority that God, and then we try to justify and saying, well, God is pleased with me providing for my home. Take heed because you're creating a God of your fantasies because he's not pleased. When you give up your relationship with him, for the things of this world. 
Should you feel condemned for what I'm saying? Should you feel, oh God, I'm, I'm worthless? No, 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 you shouldn't. Because it doesn't matter what you have been doing this past week, this past month, how much you've been running from God, all you need is to open up your heart and your ears to God this morning, today, and God will respond to you. God will respond to you. Every time we come to the house of God, we have to come with an open heart. Every time we come to the house of God and hear the word, we must take heed with the measure, the measure of our ears. How am I hearing? Am I hearing? Am I not willing for God to transform everything? Or is my house an open house? God, whatever you want to do. You take your finger and see if there's dust collecting on my countertops. Hallelujah. Go look under my bed. I got my dirty socks under the bed. God, you, you're willing. I, I'm willing. You can find whatever you need to find in my home. My home is open for you. This is why the Apostle Paul describes it as a living sacrifice. You're a living sacrifice to God. Is anybody willing this morning? God, whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do. And can I tell you the promise is that as the rain comes down from heaven, hallelujah, and it showers on the earth, I feel live today. That rain comes down, it's going to start budding. It's, it's good. You're going to start feeling more joy and more peace. Life is coming to you this morning. Life is coming to you because the rain of the word, hey, it's falling down on you. I want to invite you to this altar. Is anybody willing today? Come on. Is anybody willing today to give everything to God? Just give it to the Lord today, and He's going to shower you. Our youth, you're going to be hearing the Word of God this whole next week, and it's up to you to decide, how am I going to listen? Am I going to let my life be transformed? Lifeline, we're going to prayer retreat in about two weeks. It's for us to decide, what are we going to do with what God is speaking to us? Church, we're going into a season where the Word of God is going to be sent to us, and we have to decide in ourselves. Are we going to let God transform us? As you come, can you just raise your hands this morning? Raising your hands means surrender. It means you're opening up the doors. I'm opening up the doors of my life today. God, whatever you want to do, God, I surrender. God, I surrender today. Lord, I'm opening up my heart today and opening up my mind. Spirit of God, flow. Spirit of God, move in this place. Spirit of God, rain down, God, on your people today. Thank you. 